Well, have you looked at the pictures yet on the coasttocoastam.com website and enterprisemission.com? You should of Mars, because here he is, the head of the Enterprise Mission and also darkmission.net, Richard Hoagland. And and you really haven't been at it for a 100 years. I only said that. If you keep saying that, they're going to confuse me with John McCain. <laughs> exactly. Oh, Richard, Richard, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you? I have missed your melodious voice, my and friend. I haven't missed yours because I get to hear you every single night. Well, thank you so much. Hey, these pictures, Richard, of Mars are absolutely striking. Well, they're, they're, they're so cool for several reasons. One is <clears throat> they're artistic images. They really show off Mars to its best photogenic. I mean, this is like having an entire planet that looks like the Grand Canyon. Yes. You know, or the American South, the, 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 as you used to say, the great American Southwest. I mean, this is an incredibly photogenic place, and we've got technology there now in orbit, which actually can reveal it in real color for the first time. And the, the Europeans, the, the German space agency in particular, have been taking their pictures and making these 3D color obliques. So you get a real sense of the scale and the majesty and the awesomeness of the Martian landscape. And the fact that this is a landscape that's undergone incredible, enormous change. I was thinking that when I was looking at the pictures late yesterday and today. And it got kind of eerie for me, Richard, because I realized, and, and we'll have you chat about your theory again, and Tom Van Flandern, your friend, who was on with us about a month ago, about what happened to Mars. But it was so eerie because I'm looking at what could be a desolate planet now that once must have been teeming with everything well there's it's gone. two lines of evidence <clears throat> and you're absolutely right george the first line are these images which show massive water erosion water erosion has a certain signature to geologists looking at pictures and the resolution is good enough now and the 3d you know creation of these of these oblique images is good enough that they can actually see evidence of major, major water erosion on enormous numbers of square miles of Martian landscape. We're talking thousands and thousands and thousands of square miles indicating an enormous amount of water at some point. Then you go to the results from the American spacecraft, from NASA's Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, MRO, and a gadget on board called CRISM, which stands for the Reconnaissance Spectrometer, the compact spectrometer, that's where the sea comes from, and what it basically has been doing is looking down from orbit and taking the fingerprints, the spectral fingerprints of the chemistry of the surface. So we're not just looking at nice, pretty pictures, we're looking at pictures that actually give us the chemical composition, and they found all over the southern hemisphere, which is the one that has all those craters, um, various minerals called phyllosilicates which are minerals, you know, clays basically, rich in iron, magnesium, aluminum, mica, or even something called kaolinite, which is an ingredient in kaopectate. <laughs> 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 we will make no Martian jokes tonight, right, George? No, right. no we won't. Okay, so they, they found, you know, millions of square miles of this stuff on the southern hemisphere of Mars, which is the one that's been bashed and battered and cratered, and their standard model, this is where we get up to what Tom and I have been saying versus what NASA is saying, their standard model says, okay, the southern hemisphere of Mars has all these craters, wall-to-wall -wall craters, indicates incredible ancient age. But the craters, you know, have lasted, persisted from the beginning of the solar system at a time when, you know, asteroids and meteors were flying all over the solar system and bashing into planets, and this is an evidence of a fossil cratering epic that has been preserved to the present day. What, what Tom and I do is we look at these same pictures and the same data and we say, aha, this is more confirmation that no, the southern hemisphere of Mars is not ancient, billions and billions of years old, like NASA says, right. but is in fact only a few million years old, dating back to maybe the era of the dinosaurs on Earth, 65 million years. And what the craters have revealed is in these craters at the edges and the bottoms, is where you find these minerals indicative, the phyllosilicates, of lots and lots and lots of water. So what that's saying is that the craters landed on top of the previous surface. Some of it has eroded, revealing the rocks containing the water um, 
morphed or, or transmogrified minerals at the bottoms and the edges of the craters. And so this is evidence for the young biosphere on Mars, a young wet epoch that literally came to a crashing, catastrophic end only about 65 million years ago. And you know, George, where this is ultimately going, right? Oh, yes. We've oh, got yes. to have men and women on Mars in an expedition to sort all this out with human beings on the planet. Even bringing back rocks, like they're, the Europeans and NASA are now talking for 2013, 2015, bringing back what they call sample return missions, rocks from Mars, will not do it because no robot can pick the right rocks and then you send them all the way back and, whoops, you should have taken the one to the right of the one you got. You've got to have geologists, you've got to have scientists yeah. on the ground able to pick out the right samples and do the analysis on site. And at that point, all bets are off. Now, what I see in the long term here is, remember, I'm, I've been talking on, on the show for a long time about what I call the drip, drip, drip political model. Mm -hmm. That we get one piece of data today, one piece of data tomorrow, one piece of data day after tomorrow, one piece of data next week, one piece of data two years from now, and it's building toward the inevitability that, A, there once was teeming life on Mars, and, B, there's probably still somebody left there microbes or maybe something slightly more sophisticated, lichens or whatever. But they don't ever send the equipment all at once on any of these missions to give us the answer now. It's always going to be tomorrow or yeah, next little, week. Little or puzzle next pieces. We can't see the entire picture. You do, but well, they give us little puzzle pieces. To know, a, the science is already in. I mean, remember when a few weeks ago there was this astonishing revelation that the soil of Mars at the North Pole, where the Mars Phoenix has landed, is like the soil in your garden. You could grow asparagus. Now, that is so contradictory to the reports yeah. from Viking 30-plus years ago that the soils of Mars were incredibly hostile, filled with oxidizing peroxide, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So one of these two reports has got to be wrong, and my bet is it's the Viking data, which was carefully, shall we say, spun politically because it wasn't time yet on the drip, drip, drip political model to let people on Earth know, hey, Mars used to be, in the crib words of Elton John, the kind of place to raise your kids. And this calamity must have happened pretty darn fast. Well, again, in the, in the Tom and, and, and my model, Mars was a satellite. It was a moon orbiting planet 4, mm -hmm. which blew up. And, you know, Tom and I have wonderful disagreements about what made it blow up. I think it's very straightforward. Hyperdimensional physics, when it comes unleashed, is, is extraordinarily powerful and catastrophic. And literally, Mars was sitting right next door, you know, a few hundred thousand miles away at most. And so half the planet smashed into Mars and left this huge, enormous cratered side, the southern hemisphere, which, of course, has now revealed the evidence of enormous flowing water and, you know, rock-altering processes of the benign period when Mars was, again, the kind of place to raise your kids. And part of that planet also then was chipped off the asteroid that hit in the Yucatan 65 million years ago. Well, yeah, that, that one of those fragments from the exploded planet hit the uh, Yucatan the same period. And bye-bye dinosaurs, and, probably. And, and then basically knocked off the dinosaurs and, and paved the way for these little tiny marsupials, little tiny mammals to grow up the evolutionary ladder and eventually become us who have talk shows and talk to millions of people on the air tonight. What, what's going on with the Phoenix Lander these days? Well, the Phoenix thing, now this is what I mean by drip, drip, drip. You realize what year this is, what anniversary year this is, George? Um, let me think. Let me NASA think. anniversary, biggie. Na Mass anniversary. I give you a hint. I, I, I sent you a link to the Grumman Press book earlier tonight. Grumman. The Apollo 11 landing occurred. Yeah. Okay, that's 30? right. Nineteen, but 1969. Yeah. Well, it's yeah. 39 years on July 20th since we landed on the moon. Right. That's right. That's right. Next year will be 40. 39 is the key number. That's One. twice 19.5. Remember, in dark mission. Mike Barra and I document extraordinarily well with umpteen references that NASA is run by a bunch of ritualists and they don't do anything that's not on the ritual clock. 
So I've been looking for something really kind of cool that NASA will pull out of their hat this year, the 39th year. We're only hmm. a few days away, right?